Lord, that to winter weather advisory, two to four inches, and then nothing. We got very little. And so I actually said yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I actually said good. I mean, I love snow, but I'm, I'm ready. I'm ready for this and more of this and green coming out. So we do welcome you online and those who are here uh, very much. Glad you're here with us. And so if you'd like to, please stand as we read the scriptures together. So let's read this. I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you in the assembly. Psalm 22, 22. Chapter 22, verse 22. So this says, I will praise you in the assembly. We're in the assembly. And so we're going to sing a song. Praise him, praise him. So be thinking about something afterwards, if you'd like to, to praise God for in the assembly. Give me a little heads up here. So let's sing together. Praise him. Praise him. something you've seen him in him or what he's done for you. Yes, Don. My granddaughter, uh, thankful for her salvation. She was uh, baptized in Texas. Awesome. Amen. Yes, exactly. uh, I said we've been praying for him to get a postdoc position for the next school year, so to speak, and that came through this week. So awesome. Yes, certainly. Praise him for all the answered prayers. Amen. 
Amen. That's a good one. I just want to praise God because he is opening the eyes of the blind. And, and they're coming to go Christ. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? I think we just need to clap really loud because that was a lot of those were mine. God is good. He really is. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, it's our group. Well, I've been asking for, I've had prayer for a long time, but you actually answered it this past week. Awesome. It, yeah. Yeah. All right. That's, that's a great point. God works on his schedule, which is always the best schedule. And so it's just great that he does that. Even when he says no sometimes, he's on wait sometimes. It's just awesome. Anybody else? Yes, Lori. Praise God for our church. It's a great place to come. Amen. Yeah. Amen. We're glad to have you back. We got Lori and Debbie back this week after some long battles. We praise God for that. All right. Well, it is all because of God's goodness, because of His grace, and that's what goodness is. It's God giving us things we don't deserve in answering prayers to ourselves, to the world around us. Uh, and so let's sing this next song, which says, This is Amazing Grace.
at times we think, God, why? Why would you do anything for me? Because we know what we've done. We know what we've said. We know what we've thought. But that's God's grace is for everyone. Amen. And that's the greatest thing. We, I, just, I know a lot of stories from all of us. And we have so many different stories of coming from the depths of just horrible life to, to the riches of God's grace. Not because of anything we've done, but because of his goodness and his reaching out to us and, and him sending others to, to share light with, with other people. And, um, God is just so good. And so we think there's, there's no way that person could. There's no way that this person could. But God says, no, not one. Everyone can come to me. No one is too far away. So let's sing this great, this great hymn. No, not one. Diane, those who are going down to the children's church can head on down. And now you just sat down. But if you would stand up as, as Spencer reads from the Word of God, from Revelation chapter 2, verses, chapter 3, <laughs> verses 7 through 13. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the True One. One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, 
I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those who from this synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you, because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have, so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of God in the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Maybe see. What Spencer read was the word of God. It's not the word of man. It is the word of God. This, this entire book, God has given to us to learn more of him, to learn more about ourselves and our great need for him, because without him we are nothing, without him we are lost. But that's why we sing about what he's done. Um, he has done, he sent Jesus Christ to the world for us. So, we are still continuing on the revealing letters to the church in Revelation chapter 2, verse chapter 3. We've already looked at five different churches. We have today, and then next week is finishing up on these churches of what God has said. And then we'll continue just looking at the church going on beyond that a little bit. And so, in this map, which is modern day Turkey, you can see these are the churches. Um, John, who was given this, he was on an isle, island outside of Ephesus, a little farther outside of Ephesus. He had been banished there because he was talking about Jesus. He was proclaiming Jesus, and people hated him, so he'd been in prison, he'd been tortured, and they finally just exiled him to an island. And while on this island, God, Jesus had come and, and given him visions for this whole book, the revelations of Jesus. We call it Revelation. But it's all these different revelations. And one of the, one of the sections here that, that Jesus has done, he's, he's saying, John, I want you to write letters to each specific church. And they're listed here for us in, in this book. And so he starts off writing to the church of Ephesus, which is a church that was doing good things. But they were just doing. There wasn't a love for God. They were just doing their duty. There really wasn't for a love for mankind. They were just doing their duty. The next church he's writing to is the church of Smyrna. This was opposite of the church of Ephesus. This church loved God. They loved reaching out. They were an action church reaching out. Although there was persecution, although there was hatred against them, they continued to show the love of Christ and share the love and message of Christ. The third church was the church of Pergamos. It had good works, but they were holding on to some some complacency. They were holding on to some, some things that weren't right as a church. There were still some good things going on in church, but holding on to false teaching was, was starting to grow in that church. So God, through Jesus, writes to them. Then the next church was the church of Tyra, which had some good works, but they were holding tightly, tightly to some false teaching. I don't want to go back and preach on those. And then last week we looked at the church of Sardis, which was like this hydrangea, which was just, oops, <laughs> let me do that. Here, honey, here's your flower back. <laughs> it's just dry, dry and, and dead as a church. And we looked at these churches, there's, there's things that we can learn in each church for us. As we examine our own lives, these were all written to the pastors, the, they called them angels of the church, I'm not an angel, don't call me an angel. But it just that was the language there that, that Jesus was using. You know, and so I examine my own life. I, I look at our church and say, God, where, where do we need to be looking? God, we know we have some good things that you're commending us on. And so each church, I, I look at us, I pray for our church, I pray for me um, as I'm leading. And so today, as you see where the arrow is, it's a church of Philadelphia, which 
when we think of Philadelphia, what do we think of? Brotherly love. Okay. Your flyers or the Phillies or you know, we think sports too, but it's the, the, the city of brotherly love. Anybody here really been to, to Philadelphia a lot? Okay, I've never been there. Anybody live there? All right, did you, okay. Did you feel like it was the church, the city of brotherly love? Anybody? No, it's just a regular city, right? And there may be some brotherly love in there. But this city, um, at the time, King Attalus loved his brother, and so he named it Philadelphia, which means brother love. And so that's what we translated that here is it was because the king loved his brother, made the city for his brother because he loved his brother. But the area here was is known for earthquakes. And when Jesus was walking on the earth in, in the year 17 AD, uh, there was a great earthquake which destroyed the city. And so Caesar came in and rebuilt the city, and, and he wanted to name it Neo Caesarea, which is basically the, the new city of Caesar. And that didn't really catch on. But in, in AD 60, another major earthquake hit this place and pretty much destroyed so much. But it was a Flavian, Flavian uh, empire at the time. And so this Flavia guy wanted to name it Flavia. And they're like, no, we don't want that. So they've held on to this name of Philadelphia for so many, so many years. Uh, this is a little history lesson for you here. Um, this place was known for their vineyards and their great wine. That was one of the places they went. Uh, to get the good wine, you went to Philadelphia. They would export their wine. Uh, and it was, it was a hard because grain was really scarce. And there was some destruction of the vineyards to plant plant grain in the land, but it didn't grow much. And so there's a lot of people upset about that. But it's also known as the door to Asia. So as you see that, that arrow, as you were coming from the east going west, this was that doorway where you can go to the other cities. It was a place where people were always going through. I grew up in St. Louis. We had the, the gateway arch, which the gateway to the west. That's what it was. You know, it's not like you had to go through there to go west, but we wanted that. That's why we named it that, the gateway to the west. But Philadelphia was that doorway to the other cities, and so a lot of travelers went through this place. And so now let's look at this book in the church, the letter to the church of Philadelphia. And as you heard, there was, it was a good church. There wasn't any bad things that Jesus was writing about the church. And so it begins with, Again, as we look at a revealing a quality or characteristic about Jesus. And so in that seventh verse, Jesus says, Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the One who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. So he starts off, Jesus said, This is who I am. I'm the Holy One. And that takes us back to, to Isaiah and his vision in, in Isaiah chapter 6 where he is seeing heaven. He's seeing the throne and, and the angels around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. So Jesus is saying, that, that's who I am. I am there. I am God. I am the Son of God. I am the Holy One. All the other emperors, all the kings that these people really followed back then, they were not holy. They, they had parts of their life, most of their life were messed up. And then Jesus says, I'm also the true one. And we know that Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. There's no lies that came out of Jesus. There's no un, you know, white lies even. Jesus was not married here, but, but you know, if Jesus was married, his wife came up and said, honey, do I look good in this dress? He would move on. <laughs> but, he, but he's just saying, I'm the true one. He wasn't married. Um, but I think about that in my own life. I, I struggle with making right decisions. I struggle with truth, with Jesus. He says, I am the Holy One. I am the truth. And that's why he went to the cross for us, because he didn't have any sins to pay for himself. That's why he went and took the penalty for our sins. He was that perfect lamb sacrifice for us. And that's why he says, I'm the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one closes, and closes and no one opens. Jesus holds, the Bible says, the keys to death and hell. Jesus is the key to eternal life. A lot of people think, you know, 
I, I've, I've been to church with my grandma so many times, and because my grandma, she's already in heaven, I'll go there and grandma will say, come on in. Grandma doesn't have the keys. Your great-grandfather doesn't have the keys. The preacher doesn't have the keys. Jesus is the only one who has the keys to eternal life. It is through faith in what he did on the cross. It's not by our works that we're saved, but by what Jesus did in our faith in him. So he has this. He's saying, I am almighty. I am the Savior. I am the Lord. I am, I am God in this revealing himself to the church. And now revealing areas about the church is really just one great area, he says. Revelation 3, I know your works. Let's stop right there. We try to fool God all the time. You know, individually, sometimes as churches, we try to fool God. But God says, I, I know your works. You ever had a, a child who was really bad at lying? You know, and they say something, it's like, because <laughs> you know. But Jesus knows us fully. And here he's writing to the church, I know your works. And sometimes that's scary, but not here. He said, look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you've kept my word and have not denied my name. This was a church that wasn't mighty in man's eyes. They weren't the mega church. This was a smaller church. And, and Jesus said, I know you're small. And I, I know you think you have little power, but I know that you know that I have great power. Uh, Henry Blackaby, he's, he's gone to be with the Lord. He was a, a pastor. He, was, he wrote the book Experiencing God and other ones. Very, very godly man. Um, when he was pastoring up in, in Canada, there are people that came to his church and, and said, hey, can you help us this way? And he, he said he would answer this way. He said, we're, we're a small church. We, we can't help you in that way, but we can pray because God is almighty. And that's the thing. Sometimes we think as, as a body, we're, we're too small, but we serve the great almighty God. That's what Jesus is saying to this church. You have, you have to put a little power, but I'm setting an open door in front of you that I'm opening for you. I'm opening for you. We'll talk about a little bit more of that later on. And then going to verse 9, he says, Note this. You guys are a great church. And I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Now again, as I talked about in a few letters before, it's not like there's this synagogue on the, on the street that says synagogue of Satan. That's not what it's saying. It's saying there's some, some Jews, and many believe there were Jews who said they were Christians, that said they were Christians, but they were not. And, and from just the references and the place here, the history of here, they were Jews that saying, yes, salvation is only for the Jews through Christ. So if you weren't a Jew, you're just lost forever. So they were fighting against the gospel, which is for all. No, not one. It is... There's not one turned away from Christ. Whoever comes to Christ, doesn't matter your background or your present, doesn't matter where you live, who you are, whoever comes to Christ can have salvation through faith. But they were causing problems. Again, persecution is everywhere in every church, and persecution is here, in different ways here. But he says, I know they're lying, because Jesus knows all. And then he says... I will make them come and bow down at your feet, not in worship, but in humility. Because when, and we can't fully, I don't fully understand that we don't know. But what we do know is what it says here, go fall down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. That's, that's something that people who do not come to Christ in faith, who do not get saved, become a Christian, whatever term you want to use, they are going to a forever punishment away from God. The lake of fire which burns forever, which never burns out, and they never vanish, they're there forever. And one of the things, I think, one of the hardest things about that place is they will know some Christians they have come in contact with, maybe shared the gospel with them, and 
They never accepted, but they will know that Jesus saved those people, that Jesus loved those people, no matter what they thought. Even if they're different skin color, different culture, they will know that Jesus loved them. That's what he's telling the church. That they were experiencing some turmoil, yet they continued on. They weren't like the church that was experiencing persecution and said, well, let's just back away from, from that because we don't want to stir up the congregation. We don't want to stir up the community. This was a church that was loving God. And then Jesus says in verse 10, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test who live on the earth. So, this is written in the book of Revelation. We don't understand what this is saying. So many believe this is talking about the great tribulation that is coming that, that Jesus will tell John about later that is written in Daniel and, and Zephaniah and other books in the scriptures. So some believe that, that Jesus is going to take the church out before that point. We don't know. I mean, there's not a really definite on that. But what we do know is God is faithful to his promises. There was some sort of test that was coming, because this is written to the church. So there was some testing going on in the church. Yet no matter what, God is faithful. God is faithful. And we'll get more on that in just a little bit. So now we're dealing what the church is to do. Yeah, this is a church that is doing well. You know, and sometimes churches that are doing well go, now we can just sit back. We can relax. Well, Jesus says in chapter 3, verse 11, I'm coming soon. So what should you do? Hold on to what you have. Hold on to your life. Hold on to your reaching. Hold on to your sharing the gospel so that no one takes your crown. This is not saying... You better hold on because you'll lose your salvation. Because scriptures all around say so you cannot lose your salvation if it was true. And that's I think that's what he's say, saying. In, in Colossians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, Paul's writing, says, But now he, Jesus, has reconciled you by his physical body through his death to present you holy, faultless, and blameless before him. This is why Jesus came. It's why he died on the cross. He took our punishment so he can present us as followers of Christ to Almighty God, his Father, and say, they are mine. The verse 23, though, says, if you remain grounded and steadfast in the faith and are not shifted away from the hope of the gospel that you've heard. In other words, is it really true in your life? Jesus even told a parable about seeds going out. And some fell on, on hard places, some fell on the rocks, and it's like, yeah, I want that, but not really. There's many people in this world say, yes, I want to be saved, but not really. They, 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 they make a decision that was not a, a life decision. It was just a moment decision. Again, that's God looking at the heart, not us looking at the heart. But that's what he's saying to this church. Keep on. You guys are following me. Keep on following. And then more of Jesus has been revealed there, what he's going to do. But some more in, in this 12th verse, he says, the one who conquers I will make a pillar of my God, and he will never go out again. Now, in Philadelphia, there were pillars that were set up for the prominent people of the land. So if you were somebody, they would put up this pillar, and your name would be up there. You'd walk around, you'd go, ha, ah, John Sedgwick. I see he's a pretty good guy. He must be pretty big in Cole Valley. There's a big pillar out there, of him, you know, and so they would set that, and there's no pillars, right? Just my pillar that I put my head on at night. But with these pillars, every earthquake would much would take them down. These weren't lasting pillars. And so Jesus is, is giving them reference to where they live, that city. So you guys see these pillars all the time, and, and you're a small church, you go, going, my name will never be on one of those pillars. But Jesus said, because you follow me, I want to make you a pillar in the temple of God. And if you go back to the Old Testament, look at the pillars. They were, they were these beautiful things, and it's not for our glory, 
but for the glory of God. He says, I'm going to write, I'm going to write these. I'm going to make you a pillar in my, my God, and it's never going to crumble. It'll never fall. It'll be permanent. A lot of times we look at this world and say, man, I'm nothing. But Jesus says, follow me. Be faithful to me. Endure all the trials that you're going through. And then the rest of that verse 12, it says, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God, and my new name. There's a lot of writing going on here. But Jesus said, I'm going to write on you the name of my God. Moses at one point said, uh, hey God, uh, I'm going to go talk to these people, the Israelites, and I need to say who you are. And God says, I am that I am. Tell them that. We, we know that. We don't know fully, but it was Y-H-W-H in, in Hebrew, which is Yahweh, or in Latin it became Jehovah, but we don't know really God's name. But there, his name will be written on us. I don't know how. Also the name of the city. See, we were proud. They were proud of that city. People were proud of, of Philadelphia. This was the gateway to the West. So I'm a Philadelphian. But God says, I'm going to write on you the name of my city, the new Jerusalem. Yeah, we're, we're all proud of our cities pretty much, you know, wherever we live. Not proud of everything, but we're pretty much proud of where we live. But there, all pride goes to God. All glory goes to God because it's not our name. It's his name. It's not our city, but it's his city. And then Jesus said, you know what, I'm going to write my new name. But thinking about that, because we, as English people, we know it as Jesus, you know, and, and, and we know him as Yeshua. There's other names, I don't know other languages. But when we get to heaven, it's one name. And there'll be a new name that we'll all know. So we're not going, they, you know, not going to our neighbor and say, what did you say his name was? No, it's Jesus. You know? It's a new name that brings all unity to, and all glory to King Jesus. King, whatever his name is, when we get written there. One name for all. What a great thing. And then, let anyone who hears, has ears to hear, listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So, as I've been doing each week, God, what are you saying to us? So much. And in this letter, in verse 8, it says, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have little power. Oh, we have 55, 60, maybe today, 65, maybe I don't know. But compared to all of Cole Valley, this is just Cole Valley, it's 3,700 people. Depends which way you come in. One sign says 3,600, other sign says 3,700. I don't know. But compared to that, we're not very big in that. But God has opened doors for us. He has opened doors to see in our faithfulness, open doors of ministry to this community and beyond. What has God done? We're, we're celebrating our 45th year as a church uh, on March 13th, and if you go downstairs, there's some history that we finally put up after five years, put it up on the wall down there, but it's great things to read. What God has done for this community through this church, Cole Valley Baptist Chapel, it started out as, and then Cole Valley Baptist Church, and then changed New Hope Baptist Church. And God, through the years, has done things for the community. We have done things in this community for the community, for the glory of God, and helping people. And God says, I, I'm opening doors for you, but we've got to be faithful and follow his leading into ministry. <laughs> reaching out to our community and, and individually reaching out to our own neighborhoods where we live. God opens doors for us to serve him, to love others, to help others, and to share Christ. And also, verse 10, I, talk, I said we'll talk about, because you kept my command endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing. We've been through some testing these past few years. You know, and, and as a church, God has, has helped us. And actually, we're above pre-COVID numbers. But there's many churches, the hour of testing has really hurt. 
Many churches have, have shut doors or are very limited now. And it, it's not, again, because where God looks at us, oh man, there's some good people here. That's not what he's doing. But I think we've been faithful to the book. How we've, we've reached out, even during the time of unknown, reached out to our community, to our neighbors, reached out however we could in, in restricted times. And we don't know what other testing is coming forward for us individually, or as a church, or as a world. But God here says, Kept, you kept your command to endure. You kept the word to continue to follow. I'm going to keep you from the hour of testing. God is not saying, I'm going to remove you. I'll keep you in that hour of testing. From that testing, crushing, crushing you. As we follow him, and again, I don't know the future. I hope the future is bright and sunny like this day for all of this year and the next year. But we're hearing rumors of wars. We are experiencing inflation. We are experiencing hostility still. And so, individually, we're going to face some testing in our own lives. As a community, as a state, as a nation, as a world, we're going to face some testing. And as a church... We're going to face some testing. But the command doesn't change for any of them. Hold on to me, Jesus says, because I've got to hold on to you. Jesus says, I'll never let you go. We are here in Coal Valley. And no matter the testing, we must endure. No matter the testing, we must continue to share the gospel. One of my favorite verses that's written on my wall, in my office, Pursue, Jeremiah 29, 7, pursue the well-being of the city I have deported you to. Now, this is written to Israelites who were taken into captivity. They were being tested. They were being hunted and tortured. But he says, pursue the well-being of that city that I put you in. Pray to the Lord on its behalf, the city's behalf. Pray for your neighborhood. Pray for Coal Valley. Praying for Illinois, for United States, or wherever you live, wherever you work. Praying blessings on them, because when it thrives, you will thrive. Amen. When we pray for our city, our neighbors, honestly praying for them, that God would bless them. Right here it says, when it's thriving, and you're loving, and you're serving, you'll be strengthened individually and as a church because God is faithful so moving on you'll see this verse in a few weeks Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20 to 21 now to him God Almighty the Father who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power works in us so pausing here what are we asking God for for our neighbors. Prayer requests that took some time to finally get an answer. Prayer requests that we still don't have answers for. How are we asking God for others? God, please, my neighbors need you. Are we praying for them? God, my, my neighborhood is just, just horrible. Are we praying for our neighbors for their blessings? Are we praying, God, just take them out, get them out so my community will be better? That solves nothing in their life. You may have an easier life, maybe, but probably not. But asking God to, to do beyond what we ask. So, God, we need to pray big prayers. And even just thinking about it, God, I want, hmm, what's, what's a vision, God, that you have for us in this place? Is that power, the Holy Spirit lives in us as we want to glorify Him, as we serve Christ and share Christ. And it all to Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. So, this church of Philadelphia, and we just quickly go to Brother Little, but move beyond that. This was a church that loved God. 
that wanted to, to serve him and in that serving reach out with the good news of Jesus Christ all around. They were a small church that, that people thought, yeah, they're nothing. And God says, you're not nothing. You love me. You're following me. I can do. And so pray that way. It's all because of Jesus, because he is the Holy One. He is the true one. He is the one with the king keys of heaven. He is the one who opens up hearts as we pray, God, please save this person. Please move in this person's life. Please, God, give me words to say to them, to share the good news of Jesus Christ to them. And there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. And that name is? You can say it out loud. <laughs> Jesus. It's Jesus. Father, I thank you so much for who you are. God, we, we come before you. We are messed up at times, but Lord, you have worked on our life. Father, you are writing to the church, the gathered body of Christ. Father, I pray that you search our own hearts. Lord, that we be honest before you. Lord, that we allow you to come in and kind of show us some of the things that you'd write that old letter to, to us individually of encouragement to show us where we're lacking. And God, as a church, I pray that we would glorify you more and more. Move in our lives. Father, if there's someone here who doesn't know you through faith, God, that they would come to a place that they want to know you, to be saved, to put their faith in you. But Lord, I pray that our lives would sing, Oh, how I love Jesus. That's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing that hymn again. We sang it a few weeks ago. The first two verses of Oh, How I Love Jesus. Let's sing it. First times I heard uh, first time I heard Redonna's dad, one of the first times I heard Redonna's dad preach. He was a preacher, um, obviously a preacher. But he, he he was talking about that song, and he gave the illustration and stuff. He said, uh, this is what he was saying. He said, I went out shopping because I wanted to buy my wife a beautiful new dress. And I walked by the store, storefront, and saw these beautiful dresses for $100. And those are nice. I'm going to get her one of those. And he just glanced over there and he saw the sporting goods store and he, he saw this, this fishing pole, the one he's been looking at for a long time on sale for, for $96.79. A $100 dress. <laughs> fishing pole. He said, you know what? He went and got the fishing pole, and with the money he had left, he walked down and, uh, goodwill. So he went and found a dress for $2.67 plus tax. Um, and he took that dress going home, and he goes, oh, how I love Janice. Oh, how I love Janice. And he's like, I don't love Janice, I love me. 
And that's why they're singing this song. It's like there's so many things that come to my mind where I sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but it's more, oh, how I love John. Yeah, so there's, there's this story. And that's just, I'll tell you, I'll never forget that story. It's amazing. All right. So let's go through some quick analysis before we go. Or hand it to somebody who you know prays or tell them. But there's a little box next to my office back there. You can throw it in there. And I will pray for you. I don't make it public. I don't make, oh, let me tell you what she's doing. No. We pray. Tell God. Because God calls us to do so. Upcoming birthdays. Colton, birthday boy. There he is. Birthday. So, you see, they're having a big party at their house. They said all the church can come over today. <laughs> well, Colton said that because he wants presents. You know, but, <coughs> no, but happy birthday, Colton. Um, anniversary. Missed one last week. It went on the screen, but here we go. Rich and Debbie. Yesterday. <laughs> Great, it's great to see you back. In you know, we, we weren't sure if Richard killed you or what. <laughs> no, he, he loves you. Yeah, I know that. We know all of that. How many years was it, Rich? How many years was it? Thirty-nine years. So I mean, that was yesterday. So we classed for him last week. Any birthdays or anniversaries I missed? All right. Um, Mama B's tomorrow, if you want to have some coffee with us, we go meet down there at Mama B's at 9.45-ish. Some people come in later, some come in earlier, but uh, if it's your first time, I buy you coffee the first time you're there, unless you get there earlier by before me. So, uh, I'll buy you some coffee there. Just We just we just talked and have a good time. It was great last week, we had nine, was it last week? Or, yeah, it was awesome last week down there. All these people who don't work, that's what it was. Or getting off the day off. So. Um, Moving on, Wednesday morning, we pray downstairs, men, we pray, and so if you'd like to meet us downstairs, we pray for a little bit, and then go to Denny's and eat, it's always a great time. Wednesday night, we're continuing on uh, discernment, how do I know what to say, what to do, uh, really starting to move into God's will this week, at the foundation of this, it always goes back to the scripture in our life. Uh, Wednesday night, that was Wednesday night, Sunday, next Sunday, we have Bible study at 9.30, and worship at 10.30. So it's awesome. And then March 13th, I'm talking about, we have an anniversary, 45 years, uh, celebrating that on March 13th. And then Easter's coming up quickly after that. We'll have, in a couple weeks, I'll give you these cards to hand. It's an invitation to hand somebody. Really easy to do here, right? But also talk about it. Uh, we're really praying for just an awesome celebration of our risen Savior on that day. Vacation Bible School is Spark. It says Spark Studios. And so Redonna's going to come up here. And if you, I talked about it last week, if you're willing to help in some way, you're not making a commitment of where yet, but if you're willing to help in some way, come see her after the service up here this week. Get some numbers on that of who can help. Um, and then we'll work out the times and all that once we have all our helpers together in that to be able to reach out, reach into our kids and reach out to more kids. Uh, offering in the back, uh, pray about what God has given. God has blessed us so much, and He has called us to, to, to give. We don't, you know, it's it's what God has lead, lead you to do. What God has called you to do. So um, just be obedient to Him or give online also. But pray. And even if you're a regular giver, pray. Say, God, thank you. Praise Him for that. Anything else before we close? Yes, Debbie. Yes. Also, Debbie, um, we're having a meal on, on March 13th. So next week, Debbie will have all that together, what you need to bring, or what you want to we, we gave some time off. That's what I thought you were standing up to do, but I'd rather do thank you. So that's right. Welcome yeah, back, yeah. Debbie. Welcome back. And then we'll have a, a members meeting, short members meeting right after that. So that's March 13th, celebration day all around. All right, anything else? Good to see you all. God bless you. A song will be playing in the background. Just says, sing wherever you go. So take that, oh, I love Jesus, in your heart, in your life. And let's sing. Amen.